Good morning. I'm not Ted McCullough. And the reason I'm here today will be explained by Deanna McCullough, if you would come forward and share with us. Good morning. Um, first, this is an email that Ted sent to me very early this morning. First, and he can't say this enough, a huge thank you to Dr. Bob for filling the pulpit today on a very, very short notice so Ted could be with his mom this weekend. That's because on Thursday his mom health took a steep downturn and an emergency trip was suggested by her doctor. Ted is with his mom in California right now and he says that although she is not able to respond to him, she seems to relax when he talks to her. Her passing is expected, but as we know, God's timing can be unpredictable. And so he will ask for bereavement leave at an appropriate time, when exactly that will be is hard to predict. Currently, he will be back tomorrow afternoon, and at this point plans to lead worship next Sunday. Please know that we will keep you informed, and words cannot express our gratefulness for your prayers and the many expressions of support we continue to receive. Thank you. God bless you and Ted and his mother and your whole family. Uh, as a result of the fact that uh, I was called on Thursday, I do have uh, 45 years of old sermons. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, the sermon for the Sunday is the story of the Good Samaritan, and I did that last time I was here, and I didn't want to do it again. I thought it was a great sermon, no offense, but <clears throat> I have a dear mentor, John Purnell, who passed away several years ago when I was associate pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and John was a great preacher, and he had been in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, before he went to Greensburg to become pastor. And uh, there was a member of his congregation in Johnstown that had moved to Greensburg. And John preached a sermon one Sunday, and on the way out the door, shaking hands with this woman he had known in Johnstown, and she said to John, well, that was a great sermon, John. It was as good as it was the first time you preached it in Johnstown. So uh, I hope you won't remember the sermon that I'm going to preach today, but it's from the, uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, I would report to you the fact that uh, Ray and Marge Hayes, 59 years of wedded bliss on July 13th, and the flowers in Urn One were given in honor of Ray and Marge. And in celebration of 40 years of marriage, Nancy and Carl Burdick. And the entrance arrangement is also in celebration of Ray and Marge anniversary. So it's been so long since I've done this. Yes, absolutely. I'm looking for any other. Oh, incidentally, there's a note in the way where you come into the sanctuary that says that Reverend Kathy Chang and her husband Juan Lopez are back briefly to the United States from the Philippines and would like to share stories about their ministry in the Philippines. I would assume that this congregation supports the Chang. Is that, do you know Deanna? Does anybody know? Well, I don't either, so. But they're there and would like to see you. Also, uh, in the hospital this week, Carolyn Walgren is in St. Mary's. And Jane Bellin had knee surgery and she's back home. And Dan McClary was at Mary Freebed, but he went home Thursday. And the other announcements are in the bulletin. Uh, do you want to talk anything about uh, Nicholas uh, Schmelter's solo reciter?
Yeah, we are, we are looking forward to uh, the concert on, I believe it's Friday, July 29th. I'm just talking off the top of my head. Um, uh, let me verify that. <laughs> That's it? Okay. Um, Friday, July 29th, uh, here at First Pres, Nicholas Schmelter, he's an organi the organist at First Presbyterian Church of Cairo, uh, very wonderfully talented uh, musician, and uh, we, we certainly hope that you can join us uh, at 7.30 on the 29th. That completes the announcements, and I think it's your turn, fellow, <laughs> to do the present. Colin, you're a genius. You know how to tune that thing. That harpsichord was built by Bob Boyce, and if you look around the church at some of these wooden plaques, Bob Boyce carved those. And Tom Mills, who was also the director of music at the time that thing was built, but it's a wonderful thing to have a, a harpsichord, particularly to play music from the period so let it be that we begin our worship with a call to worship, a word spoken, a voice heard, a dream revealed, and a mission received. God calls us to fall. God invites us to embrace the lonely, to feed the hungry, to tell the good news of Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> that through his great mercy we have all been born again to a living hope through Christ's rising from the dead. For he said, I am the first, I am the last, I am the living one. For I was dead, but now I am alive forevermore, and because I live, you shall live also. 
Let it be, gracious God, that as we meet on this first day of the week, in the summer, in the beauty of this day, that we come looking to you to guide us and lead us in righteousness and goodness. Be with Ted and his family. Get him safely home to us. Be with his mother. And especially, gracious God, be with us all as we seek to be good and kind and faithful and true through the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray together to say these blessed words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. How did you know that's one of my favorite hymns? 
remarkable story behind that hymn and Harry Emerson Fosdick, who penned the words to the Welsh tune, Coomeranda. In the 1930s, there was a controversy going on, particularly in the Presbyterian Church and in other mainline denominations, between the modernists and the fundamentalists. And Harry Emerson Fosdick was a pastor, I think at First Baptist in downtown New York City, and he got thrown out because he was a modernist. He believed that the gospel needed to be interpreted in terms of the day in which we were living. And if you know what was going on in the 1930s, there were a lot of things going on. The beginning of Nazism and fascism in Europe, the Great Depression became a world depression. And uh, John Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, liked Fosdick and liked what he was saying, what his thinking was, and so he decided to build a little church up on Riverside Drive in New York City, the Riverside Church, and asked Fosdick if he'd come to be the pastor of that church, and he did, and was served there many years. He was a great American preacher, great theologian, and for the dedication of that church, he wrote this hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. I love that line, save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Indeed, that's part of our calling, part of our faith. Disregard everything in there about when the sermon is and what the scripture is, but the scripture is from the book of Hebrews. And if you want to read along with me, I'll tell you what page number it is. I just found it. Hebrews 11, on page 305 of the New Testament section of our Good News Bible. Listen for the word of God. To have faith is to be sure of things we hope for, to be certain of things we cannot see. For it was by their faith that people of ancient times won God's approval. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word so that what can be seen was made of what cannot be seen. It was faith that made Abel offer to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, he won God's approval as a righteous man because God himself approved of his gifts. By means of his faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. It was faith that kept Enoch from dying. Instead, he was taken up to God and nobody could find him because God had taken him up. The scripture says that before Enoch was taken up, he had pleased God. No one can please God without faith. For whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seeks him. It was faith that made Noah hear God's warnings about things in the future that he could not see. He obeyed God and built a boat in which he and his family were saved. And as a result, the world was condemned and Noah received from God the righteousness that comes by faith. It was faith that made Abraham obey when God called him to go out to the country which God had promised to give him and he left his own country without knowing where he was going. <clears throat> by faith he lived as a foreigner in that country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God, for Abraham was waiting for the city which God had designed and built the city with permanent foundations. It was faith that made Abraham able to become a father, even though he was too old and Sarah herself could not have children. He trusted God to keep his promise. Though Abraham was practically dead, from this one man came as many descendants as there are stars in the sky 
as many as the numberless grains of sand on the seashore. It was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God because he has prepared a city for them. It was faith that made Abraham offer his son to Isaac as a sacrifice. God put to Abraham to the test. Abraham was the one to whom God had made the promise, yet he was ready to offer his own son as a sacrifice. God had said to him, it is through Isaac that you will have the descendants I promised. Abraham reckoned that God was able to raise Isaac from death, and so to speak, Abraham did receive Isaac back from death. It was by faith that made Isaac promise blessings for the future to Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that made Jacob bless each of the sons of Joseph just before he did. He learned on the top of his walking stick and worshiped God. It was faith that made Joseph, when he was about to die, speak of the departure of the Israelites from Egypt and leave instructions about what shall be done with his body. It was by faith that made the parents of Moses hide him for three months. You could go on and on, and in this 11th chapter, I suggest sometime you take the time to read the whole thing. I'm not going to today. But there are all the examples of those people who've gone on before us, who by faith, their life was preserved or made better or more blessed. And so it is that we talk about faith this day as we gather in the presence of our dear Lord and Savior. This fall, on October 3rd, Carol and I will be married for 52 years. And our oldest son, David, will be 51 years old on the 2nd of October. Those 51 years of being a parent to three children and now a grandparent seven times over have convinced me that the role of being a parent is to a great extent like that of being a coach. One of the most significant <clears throat> roles of a coach is keeping the individual players in the game. I'm sure many of you will remember occasions when your children would like to have given up, throw in the towel, quit. And if one is allowed to do this, then sometimes he or she misses the best experiences because we're not in the game when things are about to happen. It was my own mother who on more than one occasion would say to me when I was going through some particular rough spot, like I didn't make the team, or if I did, I sat on the bench for the whole game, or some alleged friend played some particularly cruel trick on me, or a girlfriend, for one reason or another, had decided to dump me. Or some other perceived tragedy had occurred in my life, and she would say to me in response to either my lament or my tears, Robert, where is your faith? I've been hearing that recently from my own wife. How often I've thought 
of that at times when things were not going well for me or for people I was around. And the question arises most often when someone is experiencing some passage through trouble or adversity. Where is my faith or where is someone else's faith? And after the events of January 6, 2020, which marked the first time in 240 some odd years that we've not had a peaceful transfer of the presidency in this republic, or after some 341 mass killings in America since the beginning of the year, after a brutal war in the Ukraine, after the loss of millions to COVID, after all that has taken place in this country and the world, that divides us. I must admit that my faith is many times a bit shaken. And my guess is yours is as well. The unknown writer of the letter to the Hebrews is addressing a community of Christians who are the, themselves a little bit down in the mouth and down upon life itself as a result of things that are going on in their lives. It is to that community and by why way of it to us that the writer proposes what has become in scripture a classic definition of what faith is. Faith is to be sure of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. Faith is an inner conviction of something that we do not have as of yet tangible evidence for, and yet we still stake our existence upon it. At the beginning of Christianity spreading through the world, there was much persecution, and a story is told of one particular soul who was brought before a council for trial, and he was asked by the judges, do you think that the like of you will go to God in his glory should we choose to eliminate you. And the man replied, I do not think so, sir. I know. Many of you here this day will remember Pete Riefel, who was a member and an usher of this congregation, and Pete and his wife after he retired, moved up to Alanson, and then they moved back to Saginaw when Pete began to suffer from some major health issues. Pete always had a great attitude about all his health troubles. When he first had a stroke and faced serious surgery, Pete had a tremendous attitude. He always prayed for healing and asked that I do the same thing and that Somehow he would be able to proverbially dodge the bullet that had been directed at him, and his attitude is simply stated, I cannot lose, he would say. If they get it and I survive, I shall be okay, and if not, and I must die, I still win because I will be with God. Now such is not a flippant statement of a man who knows not what he is up against, but rather it is an affirmation of faith of a person who knows who they are and where they are ultimately going. I've heard that said by others and there is a theme that runs through all their thinking, believing, and acting. James Moffat the late renowned biblical translator and scholar once described several directions that inform such people's faith and hope. Such a person has a hope in God versus a hope in this world, he had said. And if we follow the world's standards, we may indeed have ease and comfort, may even be that we are prosperous. And on the other hand, if we fall in God's way, we may experience pain and loss, and we may not be popular. The conviction of a person of faith is that it is better to suffer with God than to prosper without him. That's the essence of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. They elect to worship God rather than the likeness of King Nebuchadnezzar who wants them to bow down 
to him. The great Christian writer John Bunyan, before facing trial for heresy, was said to have pleaded with God to be set free that he might do good. He, however, in the final analysis was convinced in the rightness of the will of God, no matter what the verdict might be, like Jesus anguishing in the Garden of Gethsemane, he came to believe in the ultimate rightness of the will of God. The final arbiter for him was that it was better to stake everything upon God rather than upon the likes of this world and its sense of justice and righteousness. We see the Christian hope is based upon a belief that life is not so much a matter of the senses but of the spirit. Our senses say to us, take of life what you can taste and touch and see and feel, live for the moment. <coughs> the spiritual side of our being helps us to look beyond the moment and gaze into eternity. It sees that there are things of value more than good feelings. It sees that there is a dimension even beyond the experience of <coughs> excuse me, pain and anxiety. Even beyond the ecstasies of this life to know that the greatest experience of all is to be in God's keeping, not just in this life, but in the next. I need a button to push to. To have such a hope and belief is to believe in the future against the present. One does well in life to be firmly grounded in the present, but at the same time have an eye on the future. One of the great tragedies of life is teenage suicide. A young person gets trapped in their present situation, which may be in their eyes hopeless. I once cleaned up a blood-soaked carpet with an uncle of a boy. Got a cough. <coughs> of a boy who shot himself after looking at his rejection letter from a college he wanted to attend. He wanted to follow his brother to, what, to that same school, and when he was rejected, concluded that his plan was over, all was lost, and so in a moment of despair, he shot and killed himself. Sin, some might say. A tragedy, to be sure, a tragedy that in that a permanent solution was devised for what was a temporary problem. That's the real sin, when we look at the present and can never get beyond it. And we're always called to look beyond today, what's happening. We're called to know that truth does prevail. Like that line from this is my father's world, and though the wrong seems so strong, God is the victor yet. We are called to know that whatever is right and good and true will prevail. History teaches us what soul in the dark days of 1940 England would think that the world could ever change. Or what of the dark days of the Cold War and the Berlin Wall and the threat of mutually assured destruction, which unfortunately seems to be back on the table again. That great preacher, Harry Emerson Fostick, whose hymn we sang this morning, once said of the verdict of the present being reversed by the future, he said this, there was a time in the world when the Neros of the world concerned, condemned the Pauls of this world to death as dogs. Now people call their sons Paul 
and their dogs, Nero. The question arises, why should I or anyone else commit themselves to a future with God? And the answer is that ultimately, the future is not uncertain because it is with God. The very same God who created this world out of nothing, for it was to Abraham that a promise was given. I will make of you a great nation, and you will have a progenity as many as the stars of the heaven. That kind of promise at times seems to be lost. But in the end, it was made so because God said so. Not me, nor you, nor any other power or principality. It's the same for each of us. And God loves us with such a love. George Matheson penned the words to the hymn, O oh, love that will not let me go, and I close with them. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. For it is your joy that seeketh me through pain. I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. Faith, a gift of God. May it ever keep us in life's game. May it point us with hope for things not seen and a conviction that God will ever be with us no matter what. For to God alone be the glory now and forever. Amen. And amen. And let it be, I have to look at the bullet and what we do next. I think we sing. We sing. Make me a channel of your peace.
be that we express our belief by saying together the creed of the apostles. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the dead. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord with the morning offering. In addition to those persons whose names we mentioned at the beginning of the service, Jane, Bellin, and Dan, and Dan McClary, and Carolyn Walgren, and Ted McCullough's mother, 
Penny Baldwin asked us if we remember her prayers for a friend, William, who was in the hospital, and prayers for a friend suffering from a severe bacterial form of pneumonia. And for Nick Selfridge's 44th birthday, I want to be so young. I wish my father another year of his health and happiness. Very nice. Let it be that we bow our heads to unite our hearts and minds in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, your son taught us to pray. Let it be that our prayers be for others, be the kind that you want and not just ways of getting what we want, who already have so much in our Lord Jesus Christ. So it be that we pray for these brothers and sisters who are dealing with illness, sickness, and even facing death itself. May it be that you who bind up the wounds through the good work of the Good Samaritan bind up the wounds that we all suffer as we live in this world with devils filled that would threaten indeed to undo us. May it be that we have faith that through you we can do the good works that need to be done and suffer the sufferings that might be before us. Gracious God, we pray for the world we live in. Order the unruly powers, deal with injustice, feed and satisfy the longing peoples so that in freedom your children may enjoy the world you've made and cheerfully sing your praises. You called us to be the church of our Lord. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together, telling good news to the world that people may believe you are love and live to give you glory. Gracious God, we cannot love unless we love our brothers and remove the hate and prejudice from us and all people so that your children may be reconciled with those they fear, resent, or threaten and live together in peace. Direct those who make, administer, and judge our laws, the President of the United States, and others in authority among us, that led by your wisdom, they may lead us in the ways of righteousness. Manage us, wise God, by your Spirit, so the work we do may serve your purpose and make this world a good home for all your children. For these things we pray in your holy name. Amen.
luck uh, getting out eight minutes early. I'm sure you're all terribly upset by that. But have a good rest of this Sunday and a good week. And may the Lord bless us and keep us and make his face to shine upon us. May the Lord lift with the light of his countenance upon us and grant us his peace this day and forevermore. A world without